This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Today I have for you the writings of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. She was a mystic and a visionary who inspired a lot of contemporary work in the church, um, some like the Passion of the Christ, for example. She was an inspiration for much of what you saw on the screen there, you know, things that were not that were featured in the film that were not part of sacred scripture. Here she had visions of creation. Like our Lord, uh, as the story goes, our Lord showed her Genesis, the events of Genesis. And it's it's interesting. She witnessed the, the, the fall of man, the sort of the advent of original sin, if you want to call it that. I'll let her speak for herself. It's very fascinating things she has to say here. The Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge. In the center of the glittering garden, I saw a sheet of water in which lay an island connected with the opposite land by a pier. Both island and pier were covered with beautiful trees, but in the middle of the former stood one more magnificent than the others. It towered high over them, as if guarding them. Its roots extended over the whole island, as also did its branches, which were broad below and tapering to a point above. Its boughs were horizontal, and from them arose others like little trees. The leaves were fine, the fruit yellow and sessile, in leafy calyx like a budding rose. It was something like a cedar. I do not remember ever having seen Adam, Eve, or any animal near that tree on the island, but I saw beautiful, noble-looking white birds and heard them singing in its branches. That tree was the tree of life. Just before the pier that led to the island stood the tree of knowledge. That trunk was scaly like that of the palm. The leaves, which spread out directly from the stem, were very large and broad, in shape like the sole of a shoe. Hidden in the forepart of the leaves hung the fruit clustering in fives, one in front and four around the stem. The yellow fruit had something of the shape of an apple, though more of the nature of a pear or fig. It had five five ribs uniting in a little cavity. It was pulpy like a fig inside, of the color of brown sugar, and streaked with blood-red veins. The tree was broader above than below, and its branches struck deep roots into the ground. I see a species of this tree still in warm countries. Its branches throw down shoots to the earth where they root and rise as new trunks. These in turn send forth branches, and so one such tree often covers a large tract of country. Whole families dwell under the dense foliage. At some distance to the right of the Tree of Knowledge, I saw a small, oval, gently sloping hill of glittering red grains and all kinds of precious stones. It was terraced with crystals, and around it were slender trees, just high enough to intercept the view. Plants and herbs grew round about it, and they, like the trees, were bore colored blossoms and nutritious fruits. At some distance, to the left of the Tree of Knowledge, I saw a slope, a little dale. It looked like soft clay, or like mist, and it was covered with tiny white flowers and pollen. Here, too, were various kinds of vegetation, but all colorless, more like pollen than fruit. It seemed as if these two, the hill and the dale, bore some reference to each other, as if the hill had been taken out of the dale, or as if something from the former was to be transplanted into the latter. They were to each other what the seed is to the field. Both seemed to me holy, and I saw that both, but especially the hill, shone with light. Between them and the tree of knowledge arose different kinds of trees and bushes. They were all like everything else in nature, transparent as if formed of light. These two places were the abodes of our first parents. The tree of knowledge separated them. I think that God, after the creation of Eve, pointed out those places to them. I saw that Adam and Eve were little together at first. I saw them perfectly free from passion, each in a separate abode. The animals were indescribably noble-looking and resplendent, and they served Adam and Eve. All had, according to their kind, certain retreats, abodes, and walks apart. The different spheres contained in themselves such some great mystery of the divine law, and all were connected with one another. Sin and its Consequences Part 1. The Fall I saw Adam and Eve walking through paradise for the first time. The animals ran to meet and follow them, but they appeared to be more familiar with Eve than with Adam.
Eve was in fact more taken up with the earth and created things. She glanced below and around more frequently than Adam. She appeared the more inquisitive of the two. Adam was more silent, more absorbed in God. Among the animals was one that followed Eve more closely than the others. It was a singularly gentle and winning, though artful creature. I know of none other to which I might compare it. It was slender and glossy, and it looked as if it had no bones. It walked upright on its short hind feet, its pointed tail trailing on the ground. Near the head, which was round with a face exceedingly shrewd, it had little short paws, and its wily tongue was ever in motion. The color of the neck, breast, and under part of the body was pale yellow, and down the back it was a mottled brown, very much the same as an eel. It was about as tall as a child of ten years. It was constantly around Eve, and so coaxing and intelligent, so nimble and supple, that she took great delight in it. But to me there was something horrible about it. I can see it distinctly even now. I never saw it touch either Adam or Eve. Before the fall, the distance between man and the lower animals was great, and I never saw the first human beings touch any of them. They had, it is true, more confidence in man, but they kept at a certain distance from them. When Adam and Eve returned to the region of shining light, a radiant figure like a majestic man with glittering white hair stood before them. He pointed around and in a few words appeared to be giving all things over to them and to be commanded them something. They did not look intimidated, but listened to him naturally. When he vanished, they appeared more satisfied, more happy. They appeared to understand things better, to find more order in things, for now they felt gratitude, but Adam more than Eve. She thought more of their actual bliss and of the things around them than of thanking for them. She did not rest in God so perfectly, as did Adam. Her soul was more taken up with created things. I think Adam and Eve went around paradise three times. Again I saw Adam on the shining hill upon which God had formed the woman from a rib of his side, as he lay buried in sleep. He stood alone under the trees, lost in gratitude and wonder. I saw Eve near the tree of knowledge, as if about to pass it, and with her that same animal more wily and sportive than ever. Eve was charmed with the serpent. She took great delight in it. It ran up the tree of knowledge, until its head was on a line with hers. Then clinging to the trunk with its hind feet, it moved its head towards her and told her that if she would eat of the fruit of the tree, she would no longer be in servitude. She would become free, and understand how the multiplication of the human race was to be effected. Adam and Eve had already received the command to increase and multiply, but I understood that they did not know as yet how God willed it to be brought about. I saw, too, that they had known it and yet sinned after the knowledge redemption would not have been possible. Eve now became more thoughtful. She appeared to be moved by desire for what the serpent had promised. Something degrading took possession of her. It made me feel anxious. She glanced toward Adam, who was still quietly standing under the trees. She called him, and he came. Eve started to meet him, but turned back. There was a restlessness, a hesitancy about her movements. Again, she started as if intending to pass the tree, but once more hesitated, approached it from the left, and stood behind it, screened by its long pendant leaves. The tree was broader above than below, and its wide, leafy branches dropped to the ground. Just within Eve's reach hung a remarkably fine bunch of fruit. And now Adam approached. Eve caught him by the arm and pointed to the talking animal, and he listened to its words. When Eve laid her hand on Adam's arm, she touched him for the first time. He did not touch her, but the splendor around them grew dim. I saw the animal pointing to the fruit, but he did not venture to snap it off for Eve. But when the longing for it arose in her heart, he broke off and handed her the central and most beautiful piece of the clustering five. And now I saw Eve draw nearer to Adam and offer him the fruit. Had he refused it, sin would not have been committed. I saw the fruit break, as it were, in Adam's hand. He saw pictures in it, and it was as if he and Eve were instructed upon what they should not have known. The interior of the fruit was blood-red and full of veins. I saw Adam and Eve losing their brilliancy, diminishing in stature. It was as if the sun went down. The animal glided down the tree, and I saw it running off on all fours. I did not see the fruit taken into the mouth as we now take food and eating, but it disappeared between Adam and Eve. I saw that while the serpent was still in the tree, Eve sinned, for her consent was with the temptation. I learned also at that moment what I cannot clearly repeat, 
namely that the serpent was, as it were, the embodiment of Adam and Eve's will, a being by which they could do all things, could attain all things. Here it was that Satan entered. Sin was not completed by eating the forbidden fruit, but that fruit from the tree which, rooting its branches in the earth, thus sent out new shoots, and which continued to do the same after the fall, conveyed the idea of a more absolute propagation, a sensual implantation in, its, in self at the cost of separation from God. So, along with disobedience, there sprang from their indulgence, that severing of the creature from God, that planting in self and through self, and those selfish passions in human nature. He that uses the fruit solely for the enjoyment it affords must accept as the consequence of his act the subversion, the debasement of nature, as well as sin and death. The blessing of a pure and holy multiplying out of God and by God, which Adam had received after the creation of Eve, was, in consequence of that indulgence, withdrawn from him. For I saw that the instant Adam left his hill to go to Eve, the Lord grasped him in the back and took something from him. From that something I felt the world's salvation would come. Once, on the feast of the holy and immaculate conception, God gave me a vision of that mystery. I saw enclosed in Adam and Eve the corporal and spiritual life of all mankind. I saw that by the fall it became corrupted, mixed up with evil, and that the bad angels had acquired power over it. I saw the second person of the Godhead come down, and with something like a crooked blade, take the blessing from Adam before he had sinned. At the same instant I saw the virgin issuing from Adam's side, like a little luminous cloud and soaring all resplendent up to God. By the reception of the fruit, Adam and Eve became, as it were, intoxicated, and their consent to sin wrought in them a great change. It was the serpent in them. Its nature pervaded theirs, and then came the tares among the wheat. As punishment and reparation, circumcision was instituted. As the vine is pruned that it may not run wild, may not become sour and unfruitful, so must it be done to man that he may gain, regain his lost perfection. Once, when the reparation of the fall was shown me in the symbolic pictures, I saw Eve in the act of issuing from Adam's side, and even then stretching out her neck after the forbidden fruit. She ran quickly to the tree and clasped it in her arms. In an opposite picture, I saw Jesus born of the Immaculate Virgin. He ran straight to the cross and embraced it. I saw posterity obscured and ruined by Eve, but again purified by the passion of Jesus. But the pains of penance must the evil love of self be rooted out of the flesh. The word of the epistle that the son of the handmaid shall not be joint heir, I always understood to mean the flesh and slavish subjection thereto, typified under the figure of the handmaid. The nuptial contract is a state of penance. It calls for prayer, fasting, alms deeds, renunciation, and the intention to increase the kingdom of God. Adam and Eve before sin were very differently con constituted from what we poor, miserable creatures now are. With the reception of the forbidden fruit, they imbibed a material existence. Spirit became matter, flesh an instrument, a vessel. At first they were one in God, they sought itself in God, but afterward they stood apart from God in their own will. And this self-will is self-seeking a lusting after sin and impurity. By creating the forbidden fruit, man turned away from his creator. It was as if he drew creation into himself, all created power and attributes, their commingling with one another and with all nature, became in man material things of different forms and functions. Once man was endowed with the kingship of nature, but now all in him has become nature. He is now one of its uh, servants, a master conquered and fettered, he must now struggle and fight with nature, but I cannot clearly express it. It was as if man once possessed all things in God, their creator and their center, but now he made himself their center, and they became his master. I saw the interior, the organs of man, as if in the flesh and corporal and corruptible images of creatures, as well as their relations with one another, from the stars down to the tiniest living thing, all exert an influence on man. He is connected with all of them. He must act and struggle against them, and from them suffer. But I cannot express it clearly, since I, too, am a member of the fallen race. Man was created to fill the choirs of the fallen angels. Were it not for the fall of Adam, the human race would have increased only till the number of the fallen angels was reached, and then the world would have come to an end. 
Had Adam and Eve lived to see even one sinless generation, they would not have fallen. I am certain that the world will last until the number of the fallen angels has been filled, until the wheat shall have been reaped from the chaff. Once I had a great and connected vision of sin and the whole plan of redemption. I saw all mysteries clearly and distinctly, but it is impossible for me to put all into words. I saw sin in its innumerable ramifications from the fall of the angels and from Adam's fall to the present day, and I saw all the preparations for the repairing and redeeming down to the coming and death of Jesus. Jesus showed me the extraordinary blending, the intrinsic uncleanness of all creatures, as well as all that he had done from the very beginning for their purification and restoration. At the fall of the angels, myriads of bad spirits descended to earth and into the air. I saw many creatures under the influence of their wrath, possessed by them in many ways. The first man was an image of God. He was like heaven. All was one in him. All was one with him. His form was a reproduction of the divine prototype. He was destined to possess and to enjoy earth and all created things, but holding them from God and giving things for them. Man was, however, free. Therefore was he subjected to trial. Therefore was he forbidden to eat of the tree of knowledge. In the beginning all was smooth and level. Then the little mound, the shining hill upon which Adam stood, arose. When the white blooming veil by which I saw Eve standing was hollowed out, the corrupter was already near. After the fall, all was changed. All forms of creature, creation were reproduced in self, dissipated in self. What had been one became many. Creatures no longer looked to God alone. Each was concentrated in self. Mankind at first number two, then three, and at last they became innumerable. They had been images of God, but after the fall, they became images of self, which images originated in sin. Sin placed them in communication with the fallen angels. They sought all their good in self, and the creatures around them, with all of whom the fallen angels had connections, and from the interminable blending, that sinking of his noble faculties in self and in fallen nature, sprang manifold wickedness and misery. My affiance showed me this clearly, distinctly, intelligibly, more clearly than one beholds the things of daily life. At the time I thought that a child might comprehend it, but now I cannot repeat it. He showed me the whole plan of redemption, with the way in which it was to be effected, as also all that he himself had done. I saw that it is not right to say that God need not have become man, need not have died for us on the cross, that he could, by virtue of his omnipotence, have redeemed us otherwise. I saw that he did what he did in conformity with his own infinite perfection, his mercy, and his justice, that there is indeed no necessity in God. He does what he does. He is what he is. I saw Melchizedek as an angel and a type of Jesus, as a priest upon the earth. Inasmuch as the priesthood is in God, he was an angel priest of the eternal hierarchy. I saw him preparing, founding, building up, and separating the human family, and acting as the soul of the boy returning to his body. It was explained to me that this manner of healing referred to and pre prefigured the death of Jesus. In Eliseus, by faith and the power conferred by God, we were opened again in man. All the avenues of grace and expiation that had been closed after the fall, vis-a-vis -vis the head, the breast, the hands, and feet. Eliseus stretched himself as a living symbolic cross upon the dead, closed cross of the boy's form, and through his prayer of faith life was restored. He expiated, he atoned for the sins the parents had committed by their head, heart, hands, and feet, sins that had brought death to their boy. Side by side with the above I saw pictures of the wounds of Jesus and of his death upon the cross, by which I traced the harmony between Jesus and his prophet. Since the crucifixion of Jesus, the gift of healing and repairing has existed in full measure among the priests of his church, and in general among faithful Christians. For in the same proportion as we live in him and are crucified with him are those avenues of grace, his sacred wounds, opened to us. I learned many things of the imposition of hands, the efficacy of a benediction, and the influence expected by the hand even at a distance. All was explained by the staff of Lysias, which symbolized the hand. That priests of the present day is so seldom restores and blesses was shown me in an example significant to that conformity to Jesus upon which depend all such effects. I saw three artists making figures of wax. The first used beautiful white wax, and he was both skillful and intelligent, but he was self-conceited. The image of Christ was not in him, and his work was of no value. The second used wax, not so white as that of the first, and his indolence and self-will spoiled all. He did nothing at all. 
The third was awkward and unskillful, but he worked away in his simplicity and with great diligence on common yellow wax. His work was excellent, a speaking likeness, although the features were coarse. I saw renowned preachers voluntary vaunting their worldly wisdom, but affecting nothing, while many a poor unlettered man exercises by the priestly power alone the gift of, he, of restoring and blessing. It seemed to me, while all this was shown me, that I was in school. My affianced made me see how he had suffered from his conception to his death, always expiating, always satisfying for sin. I saw this in distinct visions of his life. I saw, too, that by prayer and the offering of suffering for others, many souls that have done no good upon earth may be converted and saved at the hour of death. I, I saw also that the apostles were sent over the greater part of the earth to crush the power of Satan and to scatter benedictions. It was just those regions in which they went that had been most thoroughly twisted by the evil one. Jesus, by his perfect atonement, acquired that power against Satan for such as has received or has such as would receive his Holy Spirit, and he secured it to them forever. I was given to understand that the power to withdraw various regions of the earth from Satan's dominion by means of a blessing is signified by the words, Ye are the salt of the earth. For the same reason is salt one of the ingredients of holy water. I saw, too, in this vision that the punctulos of sensual, worldly life are most scrupulously observed. I saw the malediction following the reverse blessing. I saw the pretended miracles in the kingdom of Satan. I saw the worship of nature, superstition, magic, mesmerism, worldly arts and science, and all the means employed to smooth death over, to make sin attractive, to lull the conscience, are practiced with rigorous exactitude, even with fanaticism, by the very men who regard the ceremonies of the Holy Church as superstitious forms for which any other may be indifferently substituted. And yet these men subject their whole life and all their actions to certain ceremonies, observances, as only of the kingdom of God and of the God-man that they make no account. The world is served with perfection, but the service of God is shamefully neglected. hope you found that helpful. Advent is approaching, and if you didn't see my video yesterday on making a good Advent, I think reflecting on the nature of sin, original sin, sin in our lives, sin in society, and sin in the hierarchy is essential for our time. Let's not waste this Advent. Let's engage in acts of penance and reparation. If you haven't watched what I did yesterday, and you made it all this far into this long video today on a Sunday, go back and watch what I did yesterday. It's, it's time for us to take Advent seriously and restore the traditional Advent practices. But enough of that. Hope you have a, you've had a blessed weekend, and I will see you in the morning. God bless.